Bobby. Get him. You are listening to Brave Talk Radio. You're just in time to join today's brave conversations with your hosts, Jackie Little Guest, Daryl Williams, and Tony Emma Hill. (laughs) (laughs) Today is Daryl's birthday. Oh my goodness! Yeah. Happy birthday! Thank you. Thank you. Oh, my goodness. I will say something, but I had to remember we on the air, so God bless you, my brother. (laughs) (laughs) It's been an interesting day already, so nothing that you could uh, say or would say would be um, (laughs) This is another year, and you are at the most qualified point in time in your life. You, you really are, and God is uh, using you to do some, some mighty things and to make break some mighty strongholds on mental processes and minds through this Brave Talk vehicle. And this is only a stepping stone to what he's really called you to. Amen. This is only a stepping stone to get you back into your flow of what you know he's called you to do. Amen. So, yeah, well, yeah, I would agree. This is part of the process. Yeah. Everything, everything that happens in life is part of part of the process, and and yes, we're all at different points through a variety of means. That's true. Well, but, uh, when it comes to this show, I take the, this opportunity to speak to those who may be listening uh, seriously, and I want to offer some information that perhaps can help elucidate some of these issues that and these challenges that we're facing today, and. For the past few weeks, we've been talking about the gay manifesto, and we left left off last week, and I know that this at 4 o'clock this morning when I was up preparing for this, uh, we talked about uh, on the last uh, recording, we talked about the effeminization and emasculation of African males, or black males, let's say it that way, which is nothing more than a, a psychological assault, uh, psychological sexual assault on, on, our, on our race and our people. Um, but we need to talk about something else that is a part of it as well. And, and it started back in, I believe, the late 50s and, and 60s and really came to fruition in the 70s, and there's this thing called feminism. And I call it defeminism because what that entailed was the removal of black women uh, from our homes and traditional roles in the thousands of year old nuclear family uh, model, which the ancients called fermerty where the mothers specifically were the caretakers, uh, the queens of the castle, uh, you know, the caretakers of the home, and a nurturer, teacher, and role model to her own children. And uh, defeminism um, was, was the purposeful integration of women specifically, of uh, women generally speaking, and black women specifically into the workforce and to have them compete with and dominate their own man through a process that was called feminism, which I call de-feminism, because most, uh, well, not most, but some of the feminist uh, factions are, in fact, lesbian, and they are, in fact, a part of the gay manifesto and the homosexual agenda. This is why you have people today like Alicia Garza heading up uh, the so-called Black Lives Matter movement. We've been touching on that a whole lot as well. And, and the point that, we, that I'm trying to make or we're trying to make is that this is all by design. This is intentional. And what, what I mean by I say that is the feminism was being consciously, objectively, and subjectively socially engineered and biologically engineered uh, through some of the genetic modifications that have taken place with the food and the, and the pesticides and atrazine and all that kind of stuff, so, uh, in, and biologically engineered for the destruction of both the image and the subconscious mindset of black manhood worldwide. Defeminization, and they call it feminism, and, I, and again, I've, I've re, we termed it defeminism. Um, mm-hmm. That whole process started with the, uh, the mammy, uh, sapphire, uh, out of control, uh, cantankerous, rambunctious, vociferous, indomitable, egregious characteristics and traits from the zip coon sambo mammy propaganda characters that were engendered and mass generated and distributed by 
white, Jewish-owned, dominated, and controlled media since the media's inception in the late 1800s and the early 1900s, okay? And prior to this, you had minstrel shows and where, you know, you had Caucasian actors that dressed up and performed these hideous and disgraceful roles and characters or caricatures and depictions of our people in blackface as a form of comedic humiliation of our people. And, you know, that's been carried over because then you have people like Tyler Perry doing the same thing while getting both the support and the approval of not Hollywood, but Holly Weird executives wow. and, uh, you know, these elite uh, black pastors like Thomas Dexter Jakes. And why would I say that? Well, wow. at one of the last... Let me, let me go here because I know right now, y'all know I'm pissing people off, but it's okay. And one of the last so one of the last so called manpower conferences that took place in Atlanta, Georgia, okay, now that right there is oxymoron. A manpower conference in Atlanta, Georgia. Now, Atlanta, Georgia just happens to be the citadel of the feminization efforts of the homosexual agenda, gay manifesto activity in America when Tyler Perry at one of the last manpower conferences was a keynote speaker. Amazing. Did y'all hear what I just said? Okay, so this cross-dressing deviant was also the, a speaker at a manpower conference, but he was also one of the people that uh, was allowed to eulogize Whitney Houston. Now, wow. here's my point. Here's my point about this, and then I'm going to shut up. Since when, now y'all answer me this now, since when the cross brothers like Tyler Perry, Charles Barkley, P. Diddy, Wesley Snipes, Kevin Hart, Most Def, Bing Waynes, DeAndre Jordan, Eddie Murphy, Larry Johnson, Samuel L. Jackson. Since when do cross dressers like these guys become role models and keynote speakers to and for our people? Here's another point I want to make regarding this, because this talk. This okay, piece to you the, just, you're just rattling them all down. Yeah, you just okay. rattle them all, but we definitely want to respond to you. <laughs> okay, give me one more thing. I've got to make this point. Now, show me any respected black male African leader or role model in history, both ancient or honest contemporary, that was a cross-dresser. Now, I'm going to call a roll. Y'all tell me if I'm wrong. Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, David Walker, Denmark Vesey. Absalon Jones, Rube Foster, Martin Delaney, Jomo Kenyatta, Ramses II, Anthony Menes, Antar, Marcus Garvey, M. Hotel, Askia Muhammad, Menelik II, Tutmost III, Taharka, Diaki, Setawayo, Chaka the Zulu, King Asa, Sumi Ali Beer, Akadan, Abubakari II, Kwame Nkrumah, Sokli Carmichael, Medgar Evers, Hannibal of Carthage, Carter G. Woodson, Sheikh Atajok, J.A. Rogers, Madison Washington, Joseph Sinke, John Henry Clark, Dr. Ben, Muhammad Ali, John Jim Brown, Nat Turner, Chancellor Williams. I can go on and on and on and on. None of these leaders, none of these brilliant thinkers, none of these fearless men are cross And you're absolutely or right. Or keynote speakers. Yeah. Keynote those, speakers. Those, yeah. Yeah, th- those that I am familiar with definitely set an exemplary example of manhood, bravery, courage, protector, provider, great things mm-hmm. who cover their families and in some cases a nation with brilliant folks that mm-hmm. can think beyond their nose, folks who can think mm-hmm. out processes and not allow the system to take control right. of their minds. But what I do want to go back to, because we, we use this term defeminization, and to defeminize mm-hmm. something as it relates to and as it's defined in Merriam-Webster's dictionary is to divest of feminine qualities and characteristics. So let's break that down even further. Divest means to take away from mm-hmm. a person, to strip them mm-hmm. of their equipment, to strip Mm -hmm. them of their authority, to strip them even from their title. Do do we see now how this this whole defeminizing of women 
and and now given our title of woman to man, okay? This is a stripping down. This is a taking away from. And, yes, it started way back with the feminization movement and when women were fighting for women's rights fighting for the right to, to work outside the home, fighting for the right to work on the construction job. So I, I like wearing the dress and the know, panties in my house. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, yeah. I concur. I don't have to go to the construction site. I don't have to work on the road crew. I don't need none of that to know <laughs> who I am and why God has positioned me here. But the sad thing is, is that we have taken, again, material gain, economic gain, wealth as perceived by the world to be the, the catalyst for driving this feminist movement, number one, mm-hmm. you know, that, because that's where it started at. They used money as the carrot, dangling it in front of women. That's why women decided to, to leave their traditional roles. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Which is what really led to, you know, a lot of women being called what they say in a vulgarity type of term, I hate to say this, butch. Well, you know, there was a time when, you know, homosexuality is is, is wrong, period, okay? But there was a time when um, you had what they called the, the pretty lesbian, the feminine lesbian, you know what I'm saying, where she would wear the makeup and she'd wear the nice clothes and she would look like a woman. She was a lesbian, but mm-hmm. she was like a woman. But nowadays mm-hmm. you, have, you have these women who want to look like men. They want to dress like men. So what happened along the way? Even though homosexuality is wrong, but what happened where even the the lesbians want to look like a man. Not only are they attracted to women, they want to look like the man, take on the man. Yeah. But But even, even, yeah, even when you look at those couples, you know, some of the lesbian couples, it's pretty obvious who's the feminine one and then who's the masculine one. Right. what what is that really saying? Is it really an attraction to a female, or is it really you know something innately within you is reaching out for that male attraction? It, you know that's a great point, Tony. You have to be looking for that male. So if you're looking for a male, go get your real male. <laughs> well, why are you I mean, looking at a woman to be the male? She can never be that because if you are a woman and you want another woman. I would want somebody who looks like a woman, even though she may be a lesbian. Now, let's get something straight. I'm not, I'm not a lesbian. But, you know, my thinking is if I want a woman, I want a woman. I don't want to, you know, I don't, I don't get it. Yeah. Again, I think it just all draws back to our identity and who God created us to be. Yeah, absolutely. And... Some of these men that Daryl mentioned, such as, what is his name, Uh, Tyler Perry, for example, Uh, you know, they may be rich and they may be wealthy, they might be uh, well-to-do and doing some great things, quote, in the community, but still, I would never want a man like that to be, be the representation for my son, the boys in this world, the young men that are coming along today, I mean, he may be well-equipped financially, like we're mentioning the economic game, but he definitely could not be a role model in my world. Not to mention when you talk about him speaking at the manpower movement, there was a lot of femininity, if you will, going on at that. There were quite a few present, I know of this personally, not to mention the fact not only did he eulogize Whitney Houston's funeral at uh, T.D. Jake's manpower, they also even had the nerve to allow him to lay hands yes, T. D. Jake. Or mm-hmm. on T.D. Jakes as if he's been ordained by God to move in this direction. Now, hey, call it what you want. I just know the word says that be ye holy as I am holy. And not only mm-hmm. that, to be imitators of Christ. And last time I remember, the Christ, the God, the Savior, the Lord, the Redeemer that I serve, 
he was in no way female, no way acted as if he was. And I tell you, it's just a shame because, yeah, that equipping that God has created us to be has been diluted. Mm-hmm. Well, well, also, you know, that laying on of, of hands by Tyler Perry on a T.D. Jake. See, that's, that's transferring of spirits, okay? Yeah, and it's showtime, too. <laughs> well, yeah, it, it, is, it is showtime. And, you know, that's why even now you have to be careful of who's laying hands and praying on you. But that spirit of feminism, okay? Yeah. Your, your value yeah. system is not right. You don't even honor God like he, he has called you to honor him. And you well, laying your yeah, hands absolutely. supposedly on the man of God. Not to mention the fact nobody's talking about it but Daryl Williams and Brave Paul Radio. Oh, uh, oh, you know, well, if they are, I, I sure would like to know uh, what's going on out there because I don't hear it happening too often from the pulpit because people are trying to stay protected in their own class, literally. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. well y- y- y'all know I'm prepared to go a little deeper, but I think Tony summarized the first part of what we were talking about. Um, when she said, and I'm going to paraphrase what she said using my own words, it's, a, it's amazing how uh, two people have, that have not really talked about the subject can be on the same vibrational frequency. That's a whole other discussion. But yeah, um, yeah. I, wrote yes, down, I wrote down feminization of women, in short, was to psychologically and socially engineer the woman into a man, or defeminization. Mm-hmm with what that, what that actually is, that process actually is. And the effeminization of men, generally speaking, and black men specifically is designed to socially engineer black men uh, specifically and men uh, generally psychologically into women, uh, an example, cross-dressers. Now let's get down to the crux of this thing. <laughs> We've been talking about the gay manifesto. We've been talking about the homosexual agenda. We made it perfectly clear that when two people copulate that are homosexual or lesbian or transgender or whatever you want to call them, they're not producing anything. I've established the point by citing um, NSM 200, uh, the Global 2000 report, and I wanted to read a little bit of NSM uh, 46 today, but I'm going to skip that because that's going to take a little bit of time. Let's get down to the crux of this thing. We've been talking about the Gay Manifesto, and the Gay Manifesto is nothing more than a population control initiative of the elite and the 13 royal bloodline families. Most people don't know who the 13 royal bloodline families are. I'm going to tell you who they are. The 13 European bloodline families are the people that, and they're actually a tiny minority of the world populace. They control and dominate everything on this planet. And when I say that, I'm talking finance, I'm talking media, I'm talking the propaganda we get, uh, central banks, warfare bio-warfare, chemical warfare, and we're talking again about a tiny minority of the total populace of the planet. I remember when I was studying sociology a few years back, uh, one of my instructors told me that only a small percentage of the population control 90% of the world's wealth. And I'm like, how could that be? I wasn't familiar with what I'm getting ready to tell you all at that time. But this group of people, they control everything on this planet. They own everything. They cause all of the wars. They cause the famines. They cause all the economic collapses, all the ecological calamities. All the, uh, uh, they, they're the ones that determine political policy, public policy, foreign policy, and population policy. And so, again, the 13 bloodline families are the Rothschilds. That word Rothschild is taken from the word Red Shield. There's a book that I cited last week. Everybody should get this book. It's a good It's called The Synagogue of Satan by Andrew Carrington Hitchcock. It's one of the most informative books on the planet for anybody that really wants to know uh, what the, it, it, with Marvin Gaye uh, uh, composed a song years ago saying what's going on. This book will tell you exactly <laughs> what's going on in, in definitive detail. The Rock Shield or the Red Shield, and I'm going to tell you what the word Red Shield means when I get done with all of this. The Rockefellers here in the uh, United States, the Bruce family, the Cavendish family, or the Kennedys, Cavendish, Kennedy, Medici family, the Hanovers, the Habsburgs, the Krupps, the Plantagenets, the Romanoff family, the Sinclairs, or St. Clair family, the Warburg family, or the Blanco family, the Windsor family, also called Sachs, also called Coburg, also called Gulf. These are the most powerful families on planet Earth. The most powerful family is the Red Shield or the Rock Shield. Now, the Red Shield 
I hate saying this. All the <laughs> Let me keep going. I'll come back to that. Okay. So why is population control or the gay manifesto or the homosexual agenda such a big deal? Why is it so paramount? Why is it something that, that they had to come up with a bona fide agenda for? and use it for the purpose, purpose of population control. Y'all remember a few weeks back we were talking, uh, I think it was doing uh, Black History Month, I, I cited, and I read from a book called Anthropolipsis uh, by Godfrey Higgins, where Godfrey Higgins said everywhere they search for the origin of nations, they found a black man or something related to it. What that means is everywhere they went on this planet, they found people of color. That's what that means. Mm-hmm. And I hope the people got that. Okay, if you go everywhere on, on planet Earth, you run into people of color everywhere you go, that means that you are, in fact, a numerical minority. Okay? Okay, so what we, what we have going on here is these 13 water bloodlines that are from Europe, they only represent a tiny minority of the world population. So what we have here, in effect, is numerical inferiority. When you couple this with a non-white member, let me, let me say it this way. When you have a person of European descent and they couple with a non-white member of the majority of the population on this earth, uh, the, the minority white populace is genetically annihilated in the process. Y'all, y'all, y'all get that? Okay, because yeah. we're genetically dominant. Okay, um, and... Uh, they are not related in the process of copulation because of the dominance of the genetic capacity of the non-whites, and especially the genetic dominance of black males. To ensure, and I'm taking this, I, I need y'all to understand who I'm getting this from. She wrote a book back in 1969 saying all of this. Dr. Frances Cress Wells, and I'm going to quote her now. She, these are her words. To ensure the genetic survival of what they call skin albinism, or plainly stated, the white races, an elaborate, incessant, worldwide system is needed to control, reduce, and eradicate non-white populations everywhere on the planet. This is why you have eugenics. I told you eugenics was the scientific eradication uh, or, or the scientific process of genocide. I told you all that, and I told you all that Margaret Sanger was a eugenicist, and this is what led to what we call planned genocide or Planned Parenthood, where the United States government gives millions of dollars to plan genocide annually to perpetuate abortion, oh, yeah. primarily in the black community. That's where most of the abortion clinics are. you got Hollyweird, where billions are used to produce these deleterious, emasculated, effeminized, dysfunctional, weak, pathetic, fatuous, useless, degenerate images of black people generally and black men specifically, and these weak, Pathetic sambo uh, uh, um, faggot images are mass marketed all over the planet. Okay, we have also, and I gotta say this: the, the genetic mo- modification of food to destroy our minds, physical bodies, and ultimately our endocrine systems, thereby debilitating even our chances of reproducing. Yeah. Okay, so oh, uh, we go on. the use of noxious pesticides, atrazine and all of these things in the production of our foods that cause death and disease, okay? The devitalization of our food through genetic modification. Okay, and, and, and here's the question that, that I always I started asking, but I understand now. Why do we need to genetically modify our food? Exactly. You know, who, who does that? For, why? <laughs> well, it's, it's what the government to control the people. Yeah, I mean, it, how are you going to get the biggest spread and impact on the people? It's just like infecting the water supply. When you infect the water supply, you have now created a channel to infect all people within an area. Well, so why not it's, a form, That's why, why, why it's not a form. Food? It's a form of biochemical warfare is what that is. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. it is. Mm-hmm. Yes, the it gay is. manifesto, y'all, and I said all of that to say this. The gay manifesto, homosexual agenda, is part and parcel a part of the New World Order agenda of the tiny minority of of people on planet Earth and these 13 bloodline families designed to guarantee their survival, okay? And the dominance of that group as a means of population. That's that's why all this focus on controlling the population growth of specific ethnic groups, specifically, as a matter of fact, and y'all don't know this, back in 2014, Mm -hmm. there was a population, no, last year, there was a population control uh, meeting in France. And that's what they were there talking about, ways to eradicate the African population. That's what they were talking about. 
They said the greatest threat on planet Earth is the continued increase in the African population. And they were openly discussing ways to eradicate the African population. When you say African, they don't just mean Africans in Africa. They mean all of us. Mm-hmm. African Americans, everybody. Yeah, yeah it, it, that's right. <laughs> and, and you know, what always baffles me or, or actually disappoints me is to hear a black American uh, mm-hmm. denouncing, detesting, and trying to separate themselves from their African heritage. <laughs> now, oh, Tony, Tony. Oh, Tony. Oh, Tony. Tony. Yeah, I went there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Tony. <laughs> I, I, they really do. Now, now you they have left. their African heritage. I'm just like the guy last week who claimed to be a wigger. Hello. Tony, you now you have left me no choice but to have to read National Security Memorandum 46 from 1978. Uh, okay. yes, we're read it. You know what? Let's let's take a break because uh, I'm gonna have to pull this up up in my files and I'll read it when we come back from break. All right. Brave Talk Radio. We'll be right back. You are listening to Brave Talk Radio at TonyEmmaHale.com. Hi, this is Tony Emma Hale, and I've got one question for you. Is this your man? Well, it's, it's like this. When, when a man is not for you, the signs are always there. And I always tell women, when you're dealing with a man, there are two things you have to remember. Number one, you have to listen to what a man does, not what he says. Our actions, ladies, will tell you everything you need to know. And two, follow your instincts and ignore your emotions. The, the instincts are, are God talking to you. He's warning you to stay away from these red flags, but your emotions want you to, to ignore those instincts. And so when that happens, every single time we men are aware that we're not who we say we're going to be. We are, we are not for you. We are not honest. And ladies, men, right. all, we know how to be faithful. We know how to be honest. We know how to be committed. And we know how to be caring and loving. We simply decide who we want to treat right and who we want to treat wrong. It's it's really that simple. So if a man is not treating you the way you want to be treated, it's not because he doesn't know how. He's choosing not to. Is this your man? Join us for an exclusive series of interview with author Colin Tate beginning Saturday, April 30th, here on the Take It to the Max Radio Network. I remember I was in my apartment one day as a single person and I kept hearing someone knock at the door, but I could not possibly see them when I go check out the peephole. So I would go back to bed and then I would get back up because I kept hearing someone knocking at the door. I would check again, look through the peephole and there was still no one there. And then it suddenly occurred to me, maybe no one's knocking at my door and maybe there's no one out there. But has God ever knocked on the door of your heart and asked you the question, Hey, are you there? Are you really seeking my face and not just my hand? I believe God is knocking at the door of our hearts every day and he's asking us, Will you allow me to come in? Or do you have to see me first in order to believe me? Knowing that faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Allow God to knock at your heart. And then allow yourself to answer the knock. You'd be surprised what God has in store. This is LaTanya Worship with your empowerment today. Bye-bye. It's Brave Talk Radio on TonyEmmaHale.com with your host, Daryl Williams, Jackie Little Guest, and Tony Emmahill. Well, we're back from break, and uh, before we left off, Dr. Tony M. Hill was talking about uh, African Americans claiming they have nothing to do with Africa. They didn't leave anything in Africa, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> Let me read for you what the United States government says about African Americans and Africans uh, on the African continent. Okay? This is taken from National Security Memorandum 46, dated March 17, 1978. Under the the president at that time was Jimmy Carter. It says Presidential Review Memorandum at CM46 to the Secretary of State, the Secretary of Defense, the Director of the CIA. 
It says subject, black Africa and the U.S. black movement. I'm not going to read all of this. I'm just going to touch on a couple points. It says the president has directed that the National Security Council and a departmental group for Africa perform this review, okay? And it's signed, the first part of it is signed by Zbigniew Brzezinski. And I'm reading a book right now by Zbigniew Brzezinski called The Grand Chess Board. And what that book is helping me learn is that while we are uh, engaged in foolishness and nonsense and basketball games and empire and scandal and, and BET mm-hmm. awards and NAACP awards, these people are playing chess while we're playing checkers, okay? That's all That's I need right. to say. Uh, let That's me move right. on because I don't want us to run out of time. It says here, objective of our policy towards black Africa is to prevent social upheavals which could radically change the political situation throughout the era, throughout that area. It goes on to say, and I, and I have it highlighted, if the black, it says if black African states assume attitudes hostile to the U.S. interests, our policy towards white regimes, which is a key element in our relations with the black state, may be subjected by the latter to great pressure for fundamental change. Thus, the West may face real danger of being deprived of access to enormous raw materials of southern Africa, which are vital to our defense needs, as well as losing control of the Cape Sea routes by which approximately 55% of the Middle Eastern oil is supplied to Western Europe. Okay, I'm going down. There's a whole lot more I can say here. Here's another part. It says, Black Africa is increasingly becoming an outlet for U.S. exports and investment. The mineral resources of the area continue to be of great value for the normal functioning of industry in the United States and allied countries. In 1977, U.S. direct investment in Black Africa totaled about $1.8 billion in exports and $2.2 uh, a billion. New prospects and substantial profits would continue to develop in the country's concern. Let me continue. It says, apart from the above-mentioned factors adverse to U.S. strategic interests, the nationalist liberation movement in black Africa can act as a catalyst with far-reaching effects on the black American community by stimulating its organizational consolidation and by inducing radical action. Such a result would be likely as Zaire went the way of Angola and Mozambique. Okay, here we go. Now, this is when it gets really Interesting. It says, in order to prevent such a trend and protect U.S. natural security interests, it would appear essential to elaborate and carry out effective countermeasures. Now, here are the countermeasures. They start off by saying, for those of you who think you have nothing to do with Africa and that these people in this country don't see all of us black Americans and Africans as the same, this is what the National Security Memorandum of 1978 says birth Bam. Okay, what well, he had is, it says possibility of joint action by U.S. black and African nationalist movement. It says in elaborating, listen to me. Oh, I love doing this. I love busting people's bubbles. Um, it says in elaborating U.S. policy towards black Africa. Let me read that again. In elaborating U.S. policy towards black Africa, due weight must be given to the facts that there are 25 million American blacks whose roots are African and who are consciously or subconsciously joined together. Mm -hmm. Did y'all hear what I just said? Oh, yeah. Okay. So there it is in the National Security Memorandum of 1978. Black Americans in the U.S. and black Africans on the African continent we're one and the same. According to the U.S. government national security memorandum, they see us as the same because our roots, our oh. ancestry, everything about us comes from the African continent. That's what the document just, just said. That's what it says. In plain English, this is 1978. Well, I think the problem a lot of people have with receiving mm-hmm. that information is because mm-hmm. they have been taught to hate themselves. Because just as the slaves were beaten to take on other names, That's they right. have been taught to hate themselves, to hate where they have come from, and they have no value. They see no value in the rich heritage in which they came from. I mean, it's, it's yeah, much, much, like, much like a sinner. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. And, I mean, it's, it's, it's something that's been happening for generations. Uh, that's the reason why we have the light skin and the dark skin. I mean, it just goes deeper and deeper. 
Well, and, mm-hmm. and, it, and it also pisses me off to see people who make a mockery and play with it, like Tom Joyner and his talk shows and, and his programs where he has these light mm-hmm. skin versus dark skin wars. And it, it, it's wow. really not a laughing matter. It, it is not a laughing matter. No, it's mm-hmm. not a laughing matter because a lot of children today are being affected by that. That's the reason why they got all these issues about perm in their hair versus natural hair versus looking like the white girl. I mean, we could go on and on, but, you know, it's just a sad day when well, people don't know true well, identity, let alone don't want to know. Well, it, it, and again, it, it, what we're really talking about at the end of the day, they can get you to divorce yourself from yourself and your identity and who you are. Mm. And it works in such a way that you, in effect, become null and, and void, and, and even that within itself. Now you have something else controlling your mind because you don't have an identity in yourself anymore. You don't even know who you are. So it becomes very easy to follow the new and best thing, which is this gay, lesbian agenda to be the flamboyancy. It looks fun. It's accepting. So because you can't accept yourself, you go where you can get the acceptance from. Exactly, which creates even more division. It, 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 mm-hmm. really, it does. really does. Yeah. Well, it's confusion. It's, it's mental confusion. It's mental confusion. We, we didn't start out this way, so born that way is certainly not an option. But right. for particularly the black race, there has been an attack on the mental psyche and the mind of black people that started way back in the days of slavery. And again, go back to the, the Willie Lynch letter even when he was talking about creating division in blacks, creating and pointing out the differences in blacks in order to divide us in our minds. Exactly, because you can't go to Africa and be openly gay. They're not having it. Oh, no. Mm -mm. No. No. Where was this this taught? Hmm. Surely it wasn't taught in Africa with um, our, our people. There's another part of this I need to read because everything that you're saying, uh, it's all true, but it's by design. Everything that you just said, uh, which really goes back to the Willie Lynch isms uh, that uh, are part of this, again, all of this is in the official, is in the language of the official document that I just finished reading from. It says in this document that part of the strategy was to create See, when people say it's nonsense about, oh, that's just the way we are, when, when you talk about how we're antagonistic towards each other, we don't trust each other, um, we uh, maltreat each other, in this document, it's, it says very plainly that their strategy of dealing with us to keep us divided is to create divisions, to create mistrust, to create hostilities yeah. amongst the black groups. That was done on purpose. We're not born that way. The propaganda that... Uh, they engender and that, that, that we're exposed to causes us to be this way. How does this affect the element of division that we create in our churches where it becomes the us and the them? And wow. Well, here's I the mean, thing. That's, that's here's the thing. Light skin, it's light skin, dark skin, you know, from a cultural perspective, from a from a, a mm-hmm. racial and ethnicity perspective. But in the churches, it's and us and a them. And, you know, I can remember there was an event being held at a church once, and it was the pastors were going to eat in this room, the first ladies were going to eat in that room, and if you were not a pastor or a first lady, then you had to embellish the food trucks that might have been outside the door. You know, you can sit in this meeting, but you can't. These divisions in religion, number one, mm-hmm. denominations, but even the divisions that we cause within our own church culture, could this be a transference of that, that same mental psyche process, that reverse thinking, that divorce, the identity type thinking that has caused these type of divisions in the church? What takes you all of the, there, William? All of what you, all of All of what you just said is a carryover. We talked about it this morning. All of that is a carryover from antebellum slavery. All of that. That's how we Mm -hmm. see them. And I told you, everything about us is in our DNA. And when they they kicked us off of those plantations, we were never reprogrammed. 
uh, and we have continued yeah. on, and we are yet a dysfunctional people. Willie Lynch said all it takes is a couple of years of us seasoning and, and conditioning this way, conditioning them this way, and they'll go on for uh, hundreds of years, maybe thousands, continuing in this, in this manner. So it's just a carryover. That's why the us and them, uh, the elitism, all that stuff is a carryover from our original experience in this, in this hemisphere. It's back up. Okay. Yeah, well, and, and I, I yeah, think, a, a, yeah, too, and a large and sad part of it is the mistrust issue because I, I see a lot of rearing and raising of new leaders to not trust those who are not in the same ranks with you. You know, you, you oftentimes hear mm-hmm. in, the, in the religious sector, in the religious environment, you know, you can't counsel down. You know, what does counsel mm-hmm. down really mean? Mm-hmm. And we talk, we're talking amongst our own people, okay? See, but that's the element of ignorance that's been passed down for over centuries. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. It really has been. Mm-hmm. And it's yeah, sad, it's, you're yeah. absolutely right. It's still going on today. It's still yeah. happening in our churches. And we have different, what we call a different tier of people. It's almost like a silver, gold, platinum. You know, which one are you? Yeah, okay. and, and, I mean, how, can you, how can you possibly trust someone who doesn't trust you? And, again, the, these are the seeds that were planted in our ancestors long ago, but we see them manifesting differently in different aspects of our life and, and religious practices today. So go ahead, mm-hmm. Daryl. You, you have um, some more information you want to share with us. Okay, I'm back up. Yeah, the information I read just now dealt with uh, the fact that there's a continuum between uh, African Americans and Native Africans on the African continent. Um, but now, here we go. It also talks about, and, and what you were saying is the mistrust that we have for each other, it, it appears to be genetic or inherent or congenital, and that's not true. Um, I'm going to continue to read this document. It says, in weighing the range of U.S. interests in black Africa, basic recommendations are arranged without intent to imply priority are. Here we go. Specific steps should be taken within, with the help of the appropriate government agencies to inhibit. Specific steps to inhibit coordinated activity of the black movement in the United States. Okay, it says special clandestine operations should be launched by the CIA. Y'all remember COINTELPRO? Do y'all know what that was about? We'll talk about it another time. But I've got to continue to read this document. It says, Special clandestine operations should be launched by the CIA to generate mistrust. A special clandestine operations should be launched by the CIA to generate mistrust and hostility in American and world opinion against joint activity of the two forces and cause division among black African radical groups and their leaders and the vision amongst African Americans. This is 1978, Jimmy Carter, the brick new these these were the plans. The, word, the wordings were to inhibit coordinated uh, activity. It says special clandestine, meaning secret, meaning covert, meaning hidden. Operations should be launched by the CIA to generate mistrust and hostility. Okay, so we're not born hating each other. We're not born mistrusting wow. each other. But when you have your own government calling for special clandestine operations to be launched by the Central Intelligence Agency to generate mistrust, generate hostility. That's not us doing that. That's, that's this government doing that. Okay? It says U.S. embassies to black African countries, especially interested in South Africa. Now, they had y'all thinking, oh, they were against apartheid and, oh, and W. And, and it says... Interested in South Africa must be highly circumspect in the view of the activity of certain political circles and influential individuals opposing the objectives and methods of U.S. policy towards South Africa. Oh, somebody was lying. It says it must be kept in mind. I told y'all that everything that y'all get in the media is propaganda and, and lies. It says it must be kept in mind that the immediate that the failure of U.S. strategy in South Africa would adversely affect American standing throughout the world. So they were in support of South Africa. Okay, now, I'm not saying this. This is what the document says. This is a declassified document that I, I found, okay, because I want people to think I'm making this up. It says the FBI. So you got the CIA engaged in clandestine operations against us and the FBI 
You are listening to Brave Talk Radio at TonyEmmahale.com. 